We have an exciting partnership to announce before we get into today's Scuttlebutt. Scuttlebutt has been asked to join Reads Across America Radio, a 24-7 internet radio station where you can listen to veteran stories 24-7. Uh, you can find that on the iHeartRadio app. You can also find it on their website, readsacrossamerica.com. Or the Scuttlebutt will be featured Friday nights at 9 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. If you don't know anything about Reads Across America, they're an incredible organization, all dedicated to honoring veterans uh, and, and those who uh, gave all in service to our country. Check out the Scuttlebutt on their radio station and all the other programs that they have on their 24-7 radio station, again, on iHeartRadio app or readsacrossamerica.org. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Scuttlebutt. I'm your host, Sean Hall, Director of Programming with the Veterans Breakfast Club. We're a nonprofit in Western PA whose mission is to create communities of listening around veterans and their stories to connect, educate, heal, and inspire. You can find out everything about the Veterans Breakfast Club on our website, www.veteransbreakfastclub.org. Today on The Scuttlebutt, I have joining me one of the co-founders of Canderful, Pat Hubble. Canderful is a nonprofit whose mission is to connect transitioning military service members and career transitioners with experienced interview coaches for live personal practice job interviews so that you can nail your interview. Uh, we've had several uh, different organizations come on to the Scuttlebutt to talk about transitioning out of the military, different ways to help military personnel with that transition. And that can be uh, from getting your LinkedIn profile up and running to working on your resume. Canderful is specifically uh, built to help you with the interview process. If you have not been practicing how to interview, you may be a bit out of practice. So they're there to help you. They have over 150 volunteers who will sit down with you online. They will give you uh, live feedback and they will help you to nail your interview whenever you go in. Um, it's a really wonderful organization. Pat is great. Uh, I had such a great conversation with her. She, she's not a veteran. She's a citizen. She comes from a military family. So we talk a bit about uh, that in her history, uh, but she connected with a veteran, Pete Sukas, who's also her co-founder of Canderful. Uh, they are there to help you to get the job. Um, I hope that you enjoy this conversation please like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell on YouTube so you're the first to know whenever we release new episodes every Monday. Uh, and you can always reach out to me, Sean, S-H-A-U-N at veteransbreakfastclub.org. If you have any thoughts, questions, uh, or if you would like to be connected with Pat, I'm happy to do a warm handoff that way as well. So enjoy the show. Joining me today is one of the co-founders of Canderful. I've been very excited for this conversation. Pat Hubble, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining the Scuttlebutt. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I'm very excited to be here. This is awesome. Great. Yeah. I'd love for you to introduce yourself. You have a very interesting background and I would definitely mess it up if I tried to describe it. So please, please uh, fill us in on some of your history. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I will definitely mess it up as well. I think it's part <laughs> of being human. And I, I say that because we're going to talk about the whole job search thing and elevator, elevator pitches are going to come up as part of that. And I always tell people to just relax. And of course, as I'm preparing to do this, I'm feeling incredibly nervous to uh, to introduce myself. So I guess being nervous for an, for an elevator pitch is really absolutely normal. Yes. Mm -hmm. So again, my name is Pat Hubble. Um, I call myself a recovering management consultant and engineer. I think those two experiences in my career uh, make kind of make all the pieces that are in place to have Canderful be the success that it is. Um, I'm a University of Rhode Island graduate from way back when. I got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, worked in engineering for many years, got my MBA at MIT Sloan, two of the best years of my life, have an amazing class out there, the class of 1991. Um, and I worked in management consulting after that, then stayed home with my daughter for a while while she was going through her teen years, something that was an interesting part of my experience as well, because I left the work workforce, had to return to the workforce. Um, and had my own transition and struggle, ended up working at Cornell's MBA program, helping students interested in management and consulting prep for their job interviews. Um, and this is where I met my co-founder, Pete Sukitz, a uh, great guy transitioning out of the military as a U.S. Army captain, doing a great job in his transition and in his career search. A few years later, um, he and I spoke, and I found out that what it looked like from the outside to me was not exactly what was going on in the inside. And it had a little bit to do with what we'll talk about later, but the birth of Canderful. Anyway, after working at Cornell, I worked at Keystone Strategy, a small consulting firm in the Boston area. Um, left there after about two and a half years to join Pete with, with uh, starting Canderful, where we wanted to be able to help transitioning military and veterans. And yes, military spouses too, were really interested in supporting military spouses with the whole, how do I do a job interview and how do I do it well? How do I do an elevator pitch and have confidence, et cetera. And that pretty much brings me to my to today. I love working with veterans 
probably because um, we were just raised believing that this was a very important part of our population. My dad was a in the Army in World War II. Um, he was a P-47 pilot and loved watching part of the um, episode you had on Ed Cottrell, who was also a 101-year-old P-47 pilot. Um, my dad has since passed away, but I would love to have called him up and told him to join in is. and watch that event. Um, so I was raised on on flying stories and just, I think, a tremendous amount of respect for the military came from that. That's that's it's such a great nutshell. Um, but that what's so interesting is, and you're not a veteran yourself, um, not. but you do have a passion for helping veterans. So that started with your dad. And it's amazing that he talked about his service. So many uh, people that we talk to, that they have family members, uh, uncles, great, great uncles, you know, grandmas who served, who just didn't really talk about it. I think there's a reason for that. I, in my case, I don't know this to be a fact. Uh, my dad passed away from ALS like, quite a few years ago, so I can't ask him. But my dad never saw service. So my dad was young mm -hmm. when he joined and was trained to be trained in uh, Stearman, which is a biplane, and then AT-6 um, trainers, and then the P-47, and was just about to go overseas when the war ended. So I kind so what he had was tales of a young man with a very exciting, interesting, unusual trip through the United States to learn how to fly. So I think it was probably more positive and less frightening, but not that he didn't have frightening moments, uh, than men of his, many of his colleagues who would have actually seen service. I, and like, like you've heard, so my uncle was a Corsair pilot. My other uncle was at the Battle of the Bulge. One of my aunts was WAC and actually um, was at Cornell being trained. She and I spoke about that. Um, yeah, so I, I think part of it's because my dad didn't see service. So do you feel like that passion started there, that you always had an ear for veterans, that you just were able to talk to them a little bit easier? Um, I think that's part of it. But I also, I was helping, I mentioned I stayed home for a while <clears throat> when my daughter was a teenager. And I'm not one for, um, you know, kind of just filling my time. So I decided I wanted to start a business. And I started one prepping uh, students interested in their MBA and getting an MBA. And I ended up finding, long story about that, not worth explaining, but I ended up working with a lot of veterans, or should I say transitioning military at that time. And I found it just absolutely amazing. And they were often reluctant to truly share their stories and their emotions and pulling the stories out of them and then hearing these very dramatic stories. Um, just, I think that's actually where it started to truly hmm. get exciting for me um, yeah. because beneath these amazingly um, calm exteriors were these dramatic, interesting, emotional stories from these awesome um, young men and women. What year was that, if you don't mind me asking? Hmm. This was probably around uh, 2007, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so these are people. These were post nine eleven vets coming back right. and transitioning right. out, especially during a time where the surge was happening. There was a lot going on in the world in terms of the yes. the war on terror. Yes, we were still deeply in it. Yes. What did back then? How was the job market? And and we talk about now. It's obviously difficult for veterans to transition out, get into a civilian job. How did it look back at that time? Well, I don't know that I was quite attuned to it the way I am now because I was focused on helping students get into MBA programs. I think the job market at that, at least part of the time I'm speaking of, was actually challenging for all of us, right? And um, and so I think challenging for everybody. But at that time, there was a lot of um, passion and positive attention being given to post 9-11 military, which was helpful. Um, but I think unless you're aligned and know what you want to do and know what you want to talk about and know how you want to say it, the job market can be tough, even if the job market is doing really well around you. That's a good point. And why don't we dive straight into Canterful now, sort of our main topic of, of the podcast. But I think there's going to be a lot of sort of backstory that I'd like to fill in as we talk about Canterful, because it's a nonprofit organization that's built to help people interview. Um, we've we've had several different organizations come onto the podcast to talk about transitioning out of the military, and there's different niches that they sort of fit into. This one specifically, Canterful is built for the interview process, correct? This is correct. So there's a lot of amazing organizations out there. I think, in fact, there's so many that at times our transitioning military, military spouses have trouble figuring out which ones to use. But there are a lot of amazing organizations. Most of them, many of them work in kind of a holistic, I'm going to help you with the resume, your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm job interviewing prep, I'm going to give you advice, I'm going to connect you with a fellowship, all amazing stuff. 
But what we believe, and this fast forward to my conversations with Pete Sukitz after he got out, um, after he got his MBA and we were talking years later, was the concept of selling yourself, the concept of speaking about yourself. And this is actually very similar to what I've already said about students who are writing their MBA applications, the concept of getting inside and, and having permission to talk about the emotional side of things, talk about their experiences and talk about themselves, not just a team, it is something incredibly foreign. And um, we had done a lot of um, mock interviews at Cornell. I actually was responsible for running programs uh, where we matched alumni with students. And I was struggling to do this. It was a very um, demanding role. And so I thought to myself being, again, recovering engineer, I thought, let me gather data on whether there's truly value to our students. Because if there's not value, then the, all the hours I'm putting into this and all the demand on our alumni isn't worth it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I spent two semesters gathering data and looking at the population of students who participated in these events and the population who didn't. And I found that the students who participated were twice as likely to land their first choice job and do it six months faster. Now, there's a lot that goes mm -hmm. into that. Um, I don't think I need to unpack it for this. So somebody from an MBA uh, organization might might say, but, 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 and there's truth. There's a lot um, to unpack there. But the point is that if people are practicing, they're more likely to do better, right? Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. And if you're the one predisposed to practice, think about that. You're predisposed to actually put the effort into it you're making it, you're increasing your chances of actually landing the job. Excellent. So lead me through, you met Pete, you knew him for a while before starting Candorful. Uh, what was it about him that, that brought you back that said, we need to connect and make something? Right. So it was Pete that made the circle back, but um, Pete, um, I will generalize, I hate generalizing, but Pete, like many military was just, you know, uh, humble, fun to talk with and very respectful of me and my time. Not everybody is like this. Of course, not every military person is, but I think that there's more of a trend in the military. So I enjoyed working with him. And so he kind of, he kind of stuck in my mind. Plus when he was still at the MBA program, he was very friendly. I get the chance to meet his then girlfriend who is now his wife. Um, and he just, just was a good all around guy. So years later he called me up. So I, so I met him in 2012, I think it was. And in 2016, he called me up because he was transitioning from his first post MBA job with with uh, PNG uh, and moving on to a job at, G at GE. And he was wanted to talk about that struggle he had had with the interview piece and wanted to talk about how it actually still was somewhat of a struggle coming out of the out of the first job and. We kind of brainstormed about it and I brought him, I'm sorry, I didn't actually didn't finish this before. I brought to his attention the data from my Cornell experience. And I was like, you know, in this day of double-sided platforms, like Uber was all the discussion at that point, Airbnb was all the discussion. It's like, you know, we could make, build a community of coaches and we could match them with transitioning military and military spouses over technology. We could solve this problem and create an opportunity for mock interviews. And that conversation, which was early 2016, is where um, where the idea came from. And and we kind of started planning from there. We spent, I think, 20, the summer of 2016 just brainstorming, reading a book by uh, a professor at MIT called um, Discipline Entrepreneurship. I do recommend it to any of the, the, the um, entrepreneurs out there, Discipline Entrepreneurship by Bill Olet. Um, and we... We're able to connect with a wonderful lawyer who helped us uh, write our articles of organization and get started and incorporate. Uh, and we then started applying to a wonderful um, accelerator called Mass Challenge Boston. And it took us two years, but we got in. In 2018, we got in and we started helping people. In 2018, we helped 185 veterans and military spouses. And by last year, 2022, we were helping 1,000 just over a thousand last year, and we're we're ready to scale and increase that number. Excellent. Uh, I want to get to why Canderful. Canderful is a very interesting uh, title, but 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 because you just mentioned it, can you can you type me through the first person who you coached? Like, what was what was that like? Accepting sort of your first customer. Um, I believe I'm trying to. Th that's a good question. I'm trying to think about how we got there. Pete had posted something on LinkedIn. Don't remember exactly what it was. And he's like, I think I have our first customer. Like, oh my God, we can do this. So we actually assembled a 
team of six people, Pete, myself, and four colleagues that we had worked with um, throughout the recent jobs. And we put this person through the paces of an intake followed by three practice interviews, each with a different coach, just like just like we do now. And mm -hmm. Um, and it was very, very exciting. And then we we did, um, for I'd say the first half dozen people, we did a post-interview debrief, like what was good, what was bad. Um, and we didn't get much like, this is bad and you should fix it. It was pretty much, oh my God, this fills a void that I really, really needed help with. This was fantastic. Three different sets of feedback, three different people with three different opinions. This is exactly what I need. I feel totally stoked. And I remember um, one of them ended up in a, uh, a pretty amazing job at Amazon and mm -hmm. another ended up in a job at Facebook. Uh, it was a really unusual job. I'd have to look it up to remember what it was, but it, it ended up, uh, it was bringing in a foreign market and it was particularly interesting. Um, so we got off to the races in terms of impact pretty fast. Excellent. And so, yeah, why Canderful? Canderful, is a, it, it sort of catches your ear. It's not a word you hear all that often. So how did that come about? Yeah, that's a really good question with a not so funny story. So we originally called shortlist. The idea being, you know, we'd be your shortlist, your go-to list for getting help and for um, for being able to practice interviews. And we both really liked that name. That was Pete's idea. Re really liked that name. And then we went to um, go grab a URL. Couldn't, it was already used. And then we went to go grab social media handles and they were already used. Then we went to Trademark and found that there was a company um working on career advice with the same name so it was really too close and we talked to a lawyer about it and they said you know it's too close you're going to have if if you if both companies succeed you're going to have trouble in the future so we said okay we have to rename and this time we'll rename and have all the social social media handles etc um it was one of the hardest things we've ever done coming up with a name everybody has an opinion and if you ask opinions, uh, you're going to get naysayers more than yes. So we had to, we learned the hard way to stop asking opinions. Uh, we asked, you know, a few people we really trusted in the end. Um, Pete came up with, well, it took like two months and Pete finally said, or I said, okay, we have to land on something by the end of the weekend because it's just dragging. Um, so we made a deal that we would both put our heads down and we come up on Sunday night, we talk and we would pick one no matter what. And we both had a list and we knocked out everything but Canderful. And I'm like, Pete, I don't love it. I like it. I don't love it. He's like, do you have a better idea? We made a deal. And I'm like, okay, Canderful it is. So it's based on candor, honesty, right? So you mm -hmm. want to come to a place where you're going to get honest feedback. And candor is kind of like, we're going to tell it like it is. And so the meaning behind it, I, I do support. It's just a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> What's interesting here is that I'm thinking about all the skills that you need to sit down and, and do an interview. And I, I've been out in the job field. Uh, the scuttlebutt listeners would probably describe me as a, as a, you know, a bit of an outgoing person. Uh, I'm personable. So I feel like, you know, those things can help you in an interview process. Uh, but everyone coming out of the military may not have those, those skills, uh, you know, that they have, they haven't had time to to practice those. What skills do you think are most important, not only for military members transitioning out, but what anybody might need in, in an interview process? So I think um, th there are skills that are important. I think I want to lead with, I don't think interviewing for jobs comes naturally to anybody, maybe a rare handful, right? So I, I don't want your listeners to think, oh my God, I don't have those skills. Most people come to the table um, without the skills. Non-military come to the table young, Right. Mm. So they come to the table and they're practicing 16, 18, 20, 22 years old. And most non-military leave jobs. I think I don't know what the average is, like two, two to two and a half years. Um, so you're leaving jobs and interviewing very regularly. So even if you're mediocre, you're getting practice. The difference with military um, is is that if you've been in the military five years, 10 years, 20 years, let's start with 20. You probably never had a job interview. Yes, you've had boards. It's different from what I understand. Um, but you've never had an interview. So you're competing against somebody with probably roughly 10 to 20 years of experience for the job. And if they're a civilian, they have a lot of practice hmm. and you don't, right? So it's a matter of being uncertain, feeling very um, uncomfortable. So there's a confidence issue and then being behind the eight ball, not in the job, not in the job at all necessarily, but in the interview, right? Hmm. So I want to put it out there that lacking skills is not really the concern. It's the lacking practice, right? Mm -hmm. So skills will come. Um, having said that, let me, let me now answer directly things like talking about yourself, not just your team, 
more, I should say, talk about yourself more than talking about your team, talking about your personal impact and what you did that made you important to the role is something that military tend to struggle with, right? Mm -hmm. And some, even some non-military end, uh, end up struggling with that. And I'll talk about military spouses as well. It's a market we're trying to actually um, gain more traction with. Military spouses may very well have been having job interviews, um, but struggling with, with traction issues. There's a military spouse unemployment rate of over 24%, which is huge. Wow. Um, and mil what we've observed is military spouses tend to concentrate on their job gaps, concentrate on the fact that they move, and concentrate on their spouse, okay? Mm -hmm. And none of those none of those things have anything to do with the job they're interviewing for. So what they're doing when they're talking about that is taking your time away from talking about the skills they've got and the experience they've got that are directly related. So A, you shouldn't be talking about your spouse, whether you're a military person or not. You should be talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can introduce yourself as a military spouse if you're proud of it. Um, I'm not saying to hide it, it's just it's, it's not pertinent to the job interview. Right. Um, and if you're talking about your moves, well, I mean, keep in mind what I said earlier, the average person, non-military is leaving their job regularly, right? It's, it's just not that unusual. And now with remote work, thank you, COVID. It's one of the few mm -hmm. things we can, we can thank COVID for remote work. There are a lot of opportunities to move and stay in the same job. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, the concept of, again, of the spouse is just, uh, it really, you need to be bringing forth what you do, the impact you make. And and even if you've moved jobs, it's not that unusual. So it's thinking about yourself. Yes, you have permission to think about yourself and talk about yourself. So veterans, military spouses, it's really just the discomfort and practice. And if people come through Canderful, even if you come in unskilled to your first practice with us, your coach is going to talk to you about what you did say versus what you could say. Hmm. And interview number two is going to be better. And interview number three is going to even better, be better than that. And guess what? If at the end of three interviews, which is what we encourage people to do, you're like, okay, I'm just starting to get the feel for this. Do four, mm -hmm. do five, practice. So in a, in a way, it senses, I sense that you, you shouldn't apologize for yourself. There no. are strengths in everything that you do. You just have yes. to learn how to speak to those. Well, and you have to talk about what they are. So you have, you have to really, you have to go into the content of what you've done. So the way I talk about it, I apologize if I'm jumping around a bit, but the way I talk about it when I'm um, prepping people to do interviews, I think about it this way, because um, there's people research interview questions and there's a bajillion, right? Mm -hmm. There is there is no the common 10 or, you know, you don't know what, what you're going to be asked or the angle that's going to come at you. So I tell people, think about three or four things from the past that you have done or worked on that are related to the job you're going after, right? So you have to kind of look at the, the job description. Hopefully you've networked and talked with somebody at the company. If we can talk more about, we should talk more about, and then get a feel for what that job is and think about three or four things that are applicable from the past. And if you kind of have a top of mind what those things are and what you did and the results you got, okay? Then you'll be prepared for answering questions that are pertinent to the job from your experience. Also, think about three or four things from the past you're passionate about. It could be work, and there should, probably should be some work-related things that you're passionate about. It could be a volunteer activity. It could be something you do, like you know, solving problems when you're hiking. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But think about three or four things from the past, uh, from um, just from your passion, and think about it the same way. How are they related to the job you're going after? Be prepared with the process you went through and the results you got. And when you've got those things top of mind, you'll be ready to kind of answer questions uh, in our practice interviews and also out in the real world. How are your practice interviews structured? It's, it's you know, it's sort of a mock interview. Um, so they're coming in to interview for X company and, you know, the uh, interviewer is set with a, a set number of questions and can sort of be flexible as the conversation flows. Pretty much, pretty much that. So um, we ask our candidates, um, it's the short form of wings saying transition military veterans and military spouses, candidates. We ask them to upload a bunch of information about themselves, including their resume. And if they've got one, a job description, if they don't have one because they're a year from transitioning and they're just so freaked out about interviewing that they want to get a few under their belt. That's fine too. But that information is available um, via our technology platform to our 
to our coaches. And so the coach will see all this information about the candidate. Um, and if there's a job description in there, they will know what the role is that they're going after. And they'll kind of create mentally what it is that they're going to, um, you know, the, the interview that they're going to do. Know that I would say 99% of the people that are coming to us are in need of basic behavioral interview prep. So it is really a formula that goes like this. They'll, they'll introduce themselves. They will ask you to introduce yourself. They may, they may say, walk me through your resume. They may say, give me your elevator pitch. They may say, tell me about you. And that's the cue for the elevator pitch that I was kind of talking about in the beginning, because um, we know that's a significant part of it. Then they'll go on to behavioral interview questions, which, you know, tell me about a time you failed. And there's mm -hmm. a bajillion like that, right? Um, and they will be looking for you to use the STAR format or PAR format. So STAR is situation, task, action, result. That's the kind of the journey your answer should go through. PAR is problem, action, result. They are the same thing, just two different ways of looking at the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll, they'll probably ask, depending on the time, they will ask three of those questions, 10 of those questions. So um, we, we do these interviews the interview part in 30 minutes. So okay. they will be spending most of the time doing uh, behavioral interview questions. They're also going to say, do you have any questions for me? So there's three parts. I've said that, right? Elevator pitch, behavioral interview questions, and do you have any questions for me? The wrong answer to do you have any questions for me is no, I don't. We want our candidates to have come up with five or six questions to ask our coaches mm -hmm. and our coach won't answer them because it's a, it is hypothetical, but they will say, that's a great question or, you yeah, know, Let's reframe that. Let's try that again using a, it this way to get prepared for your real interviews. Um, so that's 30 minutes I'll spend with that. At the end of the 30 minutes, they'll stop the interview, let the candidate take a deep breath, and then they'll spend 15 minutes talking through how it went, asking the candidate what they, what they felt went well, didn't go well, and whether they have specific questions. So ideally, they're on the uh, video conferencing call for 45 minutes. Uh, the coach is supposed to take the last 15 minutes of that hour to write it up. I'll tell you, we have 130 amazing volunteer interview coaches from all sorts of companies like mm. PwC, Amazon, Oracle, Verizon, and um, Groundswell, a lot of great organizations, Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Um, they're volunteers. They are amazing. They don't always listen to me and keep it to the 45. They may put, use the full hour um, mm. and then write up the feedback later. But, uh, but that's how it goes and how lucky are we that they're so passionate they they go the full hour totally oh i was going to ask about the coaches next because if i'm a veteran uh and i'm looking for a way to build this skill set um and get some practice in it, it seems to me most veterans would want to be like i want to talk to a veteran i want to feel comfortable in the room how do you prepare your coaches to deal with uh veterans if they are not ones themselves so I would say about 35 to 40% of our coaches are veterans and a handful are military spouses. And they're, uh, the rest are people who are um, like myself. They may have a veteran in the family or they may not, right? They're just passionate about uh, helping, helping this group of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, we do, uh, in onboarding, we do a 90-minute training uh, where part of it is using our technology and how to best use it. And the other part, majority of it is how a candidate interview is done and what to look for in specific situations with our military job candidates. So we talk through what we typically see. We talk through how to kind of draw out information and give them permission to talk about themselves, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What have you found to be the most difficult thing for a transitioning military personnel coming into the job market? What, what is the main thing that they need the most coming into this, that transition? Um, I think it's willingness. Uh, there's two things. Um, the concept of networking, the word is out there. Everybody knows they're supposed to do it. Very few people know what it is. I don't know what it okay. is. Okay. So everybody thinks that, okay, I'm just going to start applying for jobs. Jobs are not gotten by applying for jobs. It is not logical. It's just that if I am um, a recruiting specialist and I get a thousand applications via Indeed, Glassdoor, whatever, um, and I've got this uh, you know, virtual stack of a thousand resumes on my desk, but my colleague comes in and says, hey, my friend just told me about this great veteran or great anybody who would like a job, take a look at his resume. I'm going to look at that one first. And if that's mm -hmm. decent or decent plus, I'm going to interview that person before I have to read those 1000 resumes, right? 
that's what's really happening in the background. It may be a little negative compared to what some people might say, but that's really what's happening. So you need to um, start building a network and then talking with people. Now, people think that means just signing on a lot, uh, LinkedIn and creating a profile. That's step one of like a thousand steps. You need to do that. So it, it's a, another whole show in itself. Uh, but the two-hour job search written by Steve Dalton, he used to be from uh, a career advisor at Duke's um, Fuqua MBA school, uh, their career advisory. So he kind of like a peer of mine from back in the day. Um, he wrote this book about what networking is and how to do it and how, and he creates a process around it. I'm a big fan, recovering engineer, right? I love process, right? Mm -hmm. So I say, get the book, don't get it in Audible, don't get it in Kindle, get this book like this, tab it up. Sorry, mine's kind of beat up. Um, and, and use it as like a workbook to continue to go back to. So that teaches the network piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. So so networking, the lack of networking, understanding and the commitment to that this is how it's gonna happen. And I'm going to I'm going to actually network with a lot of people and apply to a lot of jobs and, and I'm gonna get it. I might be a hundred jobs that I go after and I'm gonna get one or two offers. That's, that is likely the statistics you're gonna see. And, mm -hmm. and they, people come out thinking, I'm gonna apply to a job and I'm five jobs and I'm gonna get one of them. And they're very, they can be devastated because that's not how it goes and no one talks about it. The other piece is, as I've already mentioned, the, will, the need to learn to talk about themselves, mm -hmm. right? And not just talk about things at a high level. I need to go to that star par technique and talk about the impact I had and not on my team and how it made me feel, right? And why I really wanted to get this done right. And that um, is something that I think, I think culturally different. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not a veteran. Um, and, and even for military spouses, it's culturally different because I think they end up in that same um, culture of selfless, selflessness and team focus. But mm -hmm. you need to be able to talk about it. If you don't, you're not presenting data that is needed for them to make a decision about hiring you. It's a it's a way of, it's it's an odd, I keep going back to the word skill set, but the odd way of being a human having a conversation, but being able to, to, to talk about those, those bits of yourself that, that you're proud of, that, that are your strengths. Um, what would you say that is their greatest strength? Something that they need to pull from as they go into the, the job interviews. So everybody's an individual, right? So there's mm -hmm. no one answer to that. And that's a great question though, Sean, I love that. Um, everybody's an individual and for some people, you know, it can be problem solving for some people. It can be persistence for some people. It can be math skills. It can be um, team building skills. Like it can be a million things. Just like any other population, the military population is full of a variety of people with a variety of value sets and experiences. And that's what makes it so amazing. Hmm. Um, but highly skilled, um, I will say in general, you, in generalizing is always a little, little bit you know, iffy, but the military come out with a can-do attitude. Mm -hmm. um, the military come out with the ability to get things done that one could argue might be um, heads over the non-military um, population, but I'm generalizing. And so it's a little bit dangerous doing that. Is it difficult for them to translate into English their skill set? We always say like, yeah, it, it, you, you might be great with numbers, but if you go to interview as an accountant, you can't say, well, I used to shoot an M16. That... <laughs> right. Oh, it, yes. You bring up you bring up a good point. Um, and I actually have a couple slides in our our training about uh, one of our one of our former candidates who is now actually one of our coaches who was infantry and wanted to go into investment banking and successfully did it. I mean, talk about a a leap, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he had to get some education in the middle to close the gap. He ended up at Cornell's MBA program. I'm doing a little Cornell plugging here, but um, I'm not a graduate of Cornell. Um, but uh, he had to learn to t to talk about not the stuff that's on the surface, but the the things that were going on in the background in his career, not necessarily background, but the things that, well, I'll take you back to what I said earlier. He had to go understand what an investment banker was, what they did, and what their biggest problems were. And then he had to think about how that related to what he was doing as an mm. inf infantry officer. Keep in mind, there's very few people who weren't problem solving. I keep falling back on that program management. Managing, um, you know, uh, creating relationships, uh, working cross culturally, right? So, almost everybody's doing an element of those in their careers, and those are things that are definitely transferable. But on on the more superficial level, I think there is a point in time for a lot of people where they they have to learn a 
to stop the military vocabulary. And th hmm. that's a little bit like any, I won't say it's bad habit. It's just a bad habit in the context of an interview, right? So even if you're biting your fingernails, there's a time there where you're still biting, but you're stopping and reminding yourself and trying techniques. So, I, you know, when we have people that come to us and they're using terminology, A, we have to remind our veterans who are coaches that they can't let it pass. You have to call people on it, even if they understand. This is where it's actually beneficial to use somebody who's not former military because they won't understand and they'll tell you, right? In a real interview, they probably won't tell you all the time. So it's important to get this under control. But um, what we what we say is at first, you know, when you hear yourself saying a term, let it come out and then say, that means this, right? Explain it in the language that you would explain to me, right? Someone who doesn't understand it. That means this. And then go on with your story. Don't get flustered. Accept the fact that you use the term. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Explain it and, and move on. It will end up happening. Eventually, you'll skip over that term and just explain it in normal lay English. I want to jump sort of to a bigger view of, of the, the organizations out there that are attempting to be better about hiring veterans. It's not always been a, a very sort of veteran-friendly market, um, but as organizations mature, especially over the past two decades, I feel like it's been more open in the job market for veterans. Um, I could be wrong on that. And veterans who are listening might be like, I haven't experienced that. What has been your experience? Um, there are a lot of organizations out there who uh, are very dedicated to the concept of veteran hiring. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that... It, so. Um, it all really depends on what's going on internally, right? So Amazon has done a superb job, from what I can understand. They actually send a ton of their folks from their military pathways program through Canderful because they were actually uh, putting veterans in place to intercede and help and give advice and then having them come through the interview process. So they're, they're a good example of an organization. Um, it, and there are a lot of other organizations either doing similar or trying to figure out how to do similar. So there are a lot of companies that have veteran ERGs, employer re employee resource groups that are trying to work um, alongside the recruiting organizations to try to teach them on what to do and how to do it. Um, I, I think one of the best things I can tell you about that is, especially for companies or recruiters who are listening, the military, so we're very DEI focused right now in the world, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing. The military in itself is a like a an oasis of every single category of um of diversity that exists right so um if you go to the military you not only will find a military hire but you will also find a military hire from certain ethnic groups you will find military hire that are um that are certain genders right so it's actually a great uh, organization to go into to if the, if a com if a company is feeling the need to check boxes on DEI pieces, going to the military do it will give you often a double check mark, if you will, mm. um, because you're you're getting military or military spouses, um, which are a DEI category, and then you're you know also in there you've got every sing single group and every single gender, et cetera. So, um, and I I'm not sure companies have thought about that yet, but I'm hoping they will because it just helps everybody at all levels. You had some slides. I don't know if you want to pull them up now. Um, Sure, we can do that. Let me do a quick share screen. For those listening or watching here on YouTube, uh, great. You're going to get some slides. If you're listening on a podcast, uh, you can jump over to the YouTube channel, look up Veterans Breakfast Club, the scuttlebutt, Pat Hubble, uh, and you will find uh, this, uh, this podcast. You'll be able to see sort of what we're viewing, but we will definitely give a description if you continue here on audio. All right. Can you can you see the share now, Sean? Yes. Awesome. Well, I wanted to bring this up. This, this is just a slide from our pitch deck because it might help people envision what we do and what's going on. This is actually a picture of my co-founder, Pete, running an interview with Liesl, who was transitioning out of the military a couple of years ago. You can see he's speaking with her directly on his iPad. Um, we have, for the purpose of these pictures, we had people in their uniforms, but in reality, we ask people to come dressed like they were going to do a real interview because we want them to practice their new uniform. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, she's running interviews, he's running interviews with her. And on, on the left, you'll see he's got a, a form up that he's filling in because not only do we leave them with verbal feedback, we shoot out a, um, a spreadsheet, if you will. It's actually a, an email with a, eight different categories about how they did during the interview and a couple of text boxes full of information about how they can improve. So you, you walk away both with the experience, 
with advice, but also advice you can kind of go back and look at later. So, um, so it's it's very impactful. We have um, really positive feedback from people. Um, if you look at the middle of the slides, a lot of data, and it, I won't go through it in word by word, but either we have a net promoter score of 99, and net promoter score is what people use to evaluate how likely you are to tell a friend or family member to use a service. So it's kind of on your reputation. 75 mm -hmm. is considered world class. We run between like a 98 and 99. It's 99 right now. And I think this speaks to two things. One is how well we're doing it, but also um, how much need there is, right? So if people if people are finding a need and finding this fits the need and they're, they're beneficial. So um, most of the data on the top just talks about how we are have grown and we have. Um, we can grow more. We're, we're prepared to scale. So we'd like to have a lot more people come through Canderful. Um, like I said, we did over a thousand last year. We'd like to get the number up to about 7,500 per year. And I, I do want to tell you that 99.3% of the people coming through who respond to our surveys claim that their confidence and skills have improved. And 97% of that group are using words like game changer, awesome and exciting. I'm sorry. And eye opening uh, to describe our impact. So um, I highly encourage people to come through. We are doing a fireside chat for Veterans Day. We invite all our ERG, I'm sorry, all our transition partner friends. So like Hiring Heroes for Block Commit Foundation, USO Transitions, et cetera. We invite all of them and um, and all the sponsors that help support Canderful to our fireside chats. This will be run on November 1st and we're happy to invite Mike Rogers, a formal, former four-star admiral who also was a commander of the US Cyber Command and a former director of the NSA to talk about cybersecurity. You know, we used to think of cybersecurity as being something that's really, really important to um, companies, corporations, government, and it is, but it's really important for all of us at every level. So, you know, I've titled it, it's personal, it's national, it's global, because we all need to hear more and kind of get it under control. So we'd love people to potentially join. If we have corporations who are watching, we'd love them to sponsor. It's an opportunity to get your name out in front of people. Excellent. You know what I love about this, Pat? I, I love that you're doing a fireside chat. You're talking about scaling. It, you know, we've talked about Canderful being there for people learning the skills needed for interview process, but this this is a little different. So this seems like the, people are going to be able to engage with Canderful, not just through the process of learning to interview well, you have different avenues, events that you are providing as well. Absolutely. So um, yeah, we can talk about that. This this would get to the business side of running a nonprofit, right? So mm -hmm. we do run a number of events. We occasionally do um, webinars about interviewing for organizations like USO Transitions, Hiring Heroes, Four Block, State of Massachusetts. We did one. Um, I think we did one for one of the Texas organizations once, et cetera. So we we definitely do that. When we when we do that, we will go out to some of our friendly sponsors companies and ask them if they want to sponsor it so this is a, a this is for all the entrepreneurs out there who are thinking nonprofit. raising funds is really really hard so we mm -hmm. do this work for our military job candidates for free right so you can't run a business for free you have to pay people you have to buy technology licenses you have to have legal support you have to have accounting support and you can't do all that stuff by yourself so you do have to raise money just like any other organization so um, when we do some of those things, we will ask a company if they want to sponsor it. It would give um, give put a logo on the slides, thank the company for it in front of these people who are transitioning. It's a chance for uh, that company to say, hey, I support military. I'd love to hire you. So we also do uh, once a year, and we're talking about doing it twice a year, a fireside chat that um, a honors an event. So Veterans Day, in this case, we've, this is our third annual Veterans Day one. Um, we're talking about doing Patriot's Day as well. Um, and it's an opportunity for organizations to sponsor and get their names in front of uh, transitioning people and support Canderful, which they do. We have amazing sponsors and and we do it in a way that we're giving back to everybody, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's a fundraiser for us, but we're, we are, and we get a wonderful person to be willing to speak. So two years ago, we had Top Gun's Top 10, Great Leadership Book. The guy who wrote that, Guy Snodgrass, Grass, who's also now our chair, is a former Top Gun pilot. It was the year that um, the Maverick movie was coming out. So we talked about what it was like to be Top Gun pilot relative to what it looked like in the movie. Very fun. Door prizes, gave away books and coffee and different things. Last year, um, my board said, hey, bring on an astronaut. And I was like, um, 
that's not going to be easy. But I, one of our sponsoring companies, Louis Allen Hamilton, connected me with a wonderful, um, a wonderful astronaut, and we found two people from space, three people from Space Force, including Lieutenant General Nina Armano, who spoke. I was so intimidated by her; she was amazing. She was not intimidating acting, and just the concept of speaking with Lieutenant General, female Space Force. It was just amazing, and. Um, and our and Chris, our uh, our astronaut was just amazing. It, it was an outstanding event. And this year we've got Admiral Mike Rogers and our first our Top Gun pilot is actually going to be the moderator. It's going to be a lot of fun. Excellent. Uh, so you mentioned is there a cost for veterans to take part in Canderful? No, zero, free. And That's so so we so you know if you think about and I want to be really clear about that it is free. So um, if you think about it, when you go anywhere to get a service, you pay, even healthcare, you know, somebody's paying because you pay into insurance, et cetera. Um, you go to buy a candy bar, you pay. You come to Canderful to practice, you do not pay. It's it's free. But we have to run the business, which means you have to fundraise. So that's what mm -hmm. I was saying. One of the one of the ways we do it, there's a lot of ways. We, ha we ask for donations from companies, from people, um, and we do this fireside chat and we ask for, for sponsors, sponsoring companies. So what about guard, reserves, military spouses? Yes, yes. No, no it's free, free. That's such we do an not excellent... charge. We do That's not charge. Yes. Wonderful. I'm glad we're hitting that home because anybody who's listening uh, might be thinking, oh, I, I don't know if I have the money yeah. to do that. That's wonderful. No, um, All we ask, though, the one thing about running a free service, because I'm involved in another nonprofit that does free stuff, too. When you do free things, um, people sign up and don't show at a higher level because there's no skin in the game. So we ask. Right. Um, that you don't do that, right? So if people sign up and they need to cancel or reschedule, that they cancel or reschedule. <laughs> um, we are we are maintaining our passion for doing this for free. Wonderful. On your website, also just sort of going through, uh, you have something called Candor Feed. What is Candor Feed? Oh, Candor Feed is a great place to for us to share information. So, um, and it's been a while since we posted anything, but it's it's really our blog post. So we have coaches mm. who get given advice. There's an article about. Um, written by one one of our great coaches who is also a recruiter. What do, what do recruiters really want? It's one of the best articles there. Um, there's best practices about being, uh, you know, doing video conferencing, a number of articles. So it's just a way for coaches or other people to share content for our candidates. Excellent. How can people contribute? You mentioned obviously being a nonprofit, donations. Where do you accept donations? So sure, at the um, if you go to our website, canderful.org, um, you will see a donate here button on almost every page. I think every page actually um, takes you off to donor box. Um, so you you should be able to easily find that. Any email you get from us, the donate here is someplace on there as well. Um, and if not, they certainly can reach out to me at canderfulcontact at gmail.com. So that's C-A-N-D-O-R-F-U-L, contact at gmail.com. And I will help them find their way to that. Um, and if people are interested in interviewing, uh, be, I'm sorry, being interview coaches, it's another way to give mm. back. They can also email me. Um, they they can also find a link uh, via our website for volunteerism to attend an info session and participate that way. Um, yeah. Did I cover it, Sean? I think so. But I also want to uh, let you sort of, you know, give yourself a good uh, pat on the back here of what are the types of, what are the types of companies that uh, some of your uh, graduates, we call it for your candidates, that they have gone on to? Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm actually, I, I didn't share one of the slides, so I'm going to cheat and uh, and look at the slide while we're talking. So um, we've had people, a lot of people go to Amazon. Um, in fact, we know that we've impacted Amazon quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we've had a lot of people end up at companies like PwC, and I lost the slide, hang tight. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think you put me on the spot and I do what I always do. And you know, this is a really good example of what happens in an interview, right? You get you know you know the answer to a question but you freeze. Mm. So I'm going to use this I'm going to use this as a segue to help people. So take a breath, know that you know the information and um and then admit, "Hey, I I'm so excited about what's going on right now that I can't really remember the information. Let me think. Take a breath and then uh you'll be back on your way." Yeah. So we've got a lot of people that have gone to slalom. We had people at LinkedIn, Facebook, Disney, um, a lot of smaller organizations that you may or may not heard of, a lot of large ones, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman. Uh, they've ended up at transition organizations working like Four Block and Hiring Our Heroes, Gilead, Pfizer, J&J, &J, um, Lockheed Martin, Bell Helicopter, Port of Seattle, 
um, it's, it's a large list and we are actually adding to, um, or some of the things we're going to try to do, hopefully by the end of 2023, we're going to be sending out post, <clears throat> post candorful emails to candidates and asking them where they've landed because monitoring this information is actually kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. So we did, we did actually have a couple of students out of Northeastern who tried to scrape LinkedIn, but it didn't work that well. I love using technology. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to do it by way of survey in the future so we can answer that question with more data. Excellent. Hold on, please. Hi, Avi. Sorry about that. Just came through. <laughs> it's fantastic. Oh, it's been one of those days. Um, excellent. Where was I going to go with it? That threw me. I feel like I feel like this. That's exactly what it is. It's and I'll cut this, but the idea of like, okay, take a breath, refocus. <laughs> it's usually our kids aren't coming through on an interview. But you know, you know what? I if we were, you may want to even leave this in there. I'll tell you why. In this day of doing remote interviews, which is very very common, yeah, a dog can bark, a kid can go by, uh, a siren can go off outside, and staying calm, taking a deep breath maybe even handling a situation. You want to avoid that to the best of your ability, but the reality right. is it can happen. Right That's before true. you got on the call here, my cat started screaming at the door, right? So so you have to be like, oh, I have to get, I have to get this taken care of. I want a silent, nice, calm, cool, collected atmosphere. Right. Not always going to happen in an online interview situation. You're going to have the babysitter walking through with the kids and you know the cat jumping up. Right. And the only thing I will say to add to that is you want to do everything you can to prevent that. You want to warn the family. You want to get the kids out to the friend's house, whatever it is you need to do, because you are also potentially signaling to the employer, you have a quiet place to work. Even if it's not true, you want to send that signal that mm -hmm. there is a chance that you have a quiet place to work. So in a, in, I think my, my, my last question to you is in a, in a market that does have some other organizations that do the same type of work, helping with the interview process. How does Candorful stand out? And where, what do you hang your hat on that this is what you're going to get when you come to us? You know, it always comes down to kindness and friendship, right? At the end mm -hmm. of the day. Um, so we have, we have, we've just connected and partnered with all these organizations. And as I learn about them and have time to do it, I reach out to them. So if, if I have not, if somebody's listening, I have not partnered with you yet, contact me because I want to partner with you. So um, I just reached out and learned from people. I asked them questions, which by the way, what networking is bad anyway. So what I, the, the process of building Canderful is very similar to the process of getting a job. Mm -hmm. So reaching out to Mike Abrams at four block, asking him how he started a company, asking him if they would be open to trying us out and sending people to us if they liked us and bingo, that relationship was born. Same with the Commit Foundation, same with Hiring Our Heroes, same with USO Transitions. And when they realized that we're legit, um, we're doing it well. They're getting feedback from their folks saying that it's very positive. All of a sudden, we're they're recommending us uh, to their people. And, and we continue to grow those relationships and other relationships. Just so no one needs to be living where you're at. They, they can engage with Candorful across the country. They absolutely. In fact, um, of our 130 coaches, they're spread all over the country, but it, it really doesn't even matter. So we are... Mm -hmm uh geographically agnostic right so we did we've done everything over video conferencing since before covid we yeah. have this was been our model before covid we said to explain why now people get it right so 130 yeah. coaches all over the country our candidates are all over the country and outside the country still actively deployed in other places preparing for their transition and and that's the benefit of doing it over in my case zoom but any video any good video conferencing tools what our coaches use. Pat, I want to thank you for your time today. And I hope that our listeners will first just look up Canderful. And I hope that if they are looking uh, to build these skills and get practice in, that they that they connect with you. Um, it just seems like such a wonderful organization uh, to be a part of and that you have many connections, which I think as somebody, if I were looking for a job and to, to be able to interview well, I want to go with the company that has connections and can sort of help me navigate that space, answer questions that I have that aren't necessarily just about my my interview process. I I agree. Um, you know, I think building connections, and by the way, every single every single person and organization that someone meets in their transition should be, they should be reaching out on LinkedIn to A, connect with the individuals and B, write them a note of thanks, because this is how you kind of build 
build your network. It, it's been, I'll tell you, um, I have been very blessed throughout my career. I've had just like anybody in a career, I've had good times, good companies, other situations like get me out of here as fast as I can. But in each of the cases, I, unbeknownst to me, I was building a skill that ended up being needed to build Canderful, whether it was the entrepreneurial business side or whether it was the coaching side. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, even the data about mock interviews from Cornell, right? All of these things, um, I, you know, clearly I think God had a big handle on what he was doing with my career because I get joy out of every single day I work on Canderful. Yes, there are stressful mm -hmm. days. Fundraising is hard. But, you know, when I meet with somebody who's former military and guide them through the process, I walk away feeling so happy. It's like, it's like an endorphin rush that I cannot explain. And so my coaches say the same thing. I think we are wired to help each other out, which the news may not really project humans that way, but I do believe that's the truth. I love that. Um, it's certainly why I'm in mission work as well. I love working for nonprofits. I love you know the, the feeling you get for helping people, uh, offering a, a platform for worthwhile organizations, people that are out there doing wonderful work, such as yourself uh, and Pete. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much for your time. To our listeners, please like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell on YouTube so you're the first to know whenever we release new episodes. You can always reach out to me, Sean, S-H-A-U-N, at veteransbreakfastclub.org if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, uh, or have any ideas for future Scuttlebutt episodes. If you'd like to be connected with Canderful, I'm happy to do that as well and make a warm handoff for you uh, over to Pat. Um, but Pat, I'd love to give you the final word here. Thank you so much, Sean. You have been great. This has been so much fun. I can't believe how fast the last hour has gone. Um, your questions are really good. I would, just like you said, I would love to meet more people via this um, breakfast club, if you will. So um, come my way, canderful.org is our website. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, on LinkedIn and Twitter. LinkedIn is the most of, of all the social media is the one we like the most. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you to all the military job candidates, veterans, transitioning military, military spouses, guard reservists out there for all that you're doing or have done. Let us help you. You know, it's it's free. It just takes a little bit of time and you're going to feel so much better for your job transition. Come join the team. Thank you so much, Pat. Hope to see you on a future episode. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for watching this episode of The Scuttlebutt. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Uh, Tobacco Free Adagio Health has been supporting the podcast for quite some time now. We've been so pleased to be uh, supported by them. They are dedicated to reducing and preventing tobacco use and getting the word out about the hazards of smoking and secondhand smoke. They're all about health, so they want people to quit. Uh, they have classes, nicotine replacement therapy, and a popular quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. They also educate people, children especially, about tobacco use from cigarettes, cigars, pipes, chew, snuff, and other nicotine products like vaping. And finally, Tobacco Free Adagio Health advocates for public and private policies that ensure healthy places to live, work, and play. You can learn all about what Tobacco Free Adagio Health offers at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Or you can check out the two Scuttlebutt episodes that featured Tobacco Free Adagio Health. We had a wonderful representative come on to the podcast, talk to us about all the classes and therapies that they offer. Uh, it was one, two wonderful conversations. So I definitely direct you to both of those if you want more information or just call their free quit line 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Thank you again, Tobacco Free Adagio Health for your support.